Good morning, boys and girls. That's good. Nice, nice, fr friendly welcome. Thank you for all of the encouragement. Uh, and it is lovely to get encouragement from people in advance uh, of speaking. It's always good to get it in advance. I got a lovely little message um, from, from somebody who, who was saying about a pastor. And the pastor was preaching, and he was really going for it, and he was preaching really, really well. And then he noticed his child in the balcony had a, had a pea shooter. And uh, the child was using his pea shooter, and he was pinging some of the congregation in the back of his head. And uh, he tried to ignore the child for a moment or so and concentrate on his sermon. But really, the child was just picking off these, these members of the congregation one by one. And really, he couldn't, he couldn't contain himself anymore. And he was just about to launch into nailing his child from the pulpit to the balcony when the child said, Dad, you keep preaching, I'll keep waking them up. <laughs> so whenever Fiona said at the start about nudging the person beside you and waking them up, that's what sort of put that story into my mind. It's great to be in God's house today, isn't it? And on God's day with God's people. And it's been lovely to be around God's table and hear all of what Jesus has done for us. And what a privilege it is that we're, we're around now God's Word. Thank you to Hillary and the worship team for uh, leading us this morning. Thank you very much every week for all of the amazing things our worship team do, does for, or do for us. We are a truly blessed people and we should rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. Quite often when you're asked to speak, you already have something, a wee idea in your head what you want to say. God has already burdened you about something. On other occasions, as you, as you pray and as you think God lays something very heavily on your heart and you have a growing sense of direction. My experience this time uh, has been a, a wee, bit, wee bit different. And while I definitely sensed that there was something that God definitely wanted me to, to, to share with you and to talk about, it always just seemed to be slightly out of focus or just in the, in the corner, or, you know, in the, in the periphery of my, my, my vision. And as I turned, it always just seemed to escape. So a couple of uh, Saturdays ago, I decided to go fishing. And this is a place Bill will recognize uh, somewhere where Albert took us a couple of years ago. And I went fishing on a Saturday afternoon. And this is a view taken from where I was sitting fishing. And I fished for a couple of hours. And to paraphrase John 21, I went to the lake, sat on my seat, fished all afternoon, and caught nothing. <laughs> not even a bite. And in the midst of the misery of that, I, I, I texted Kim and I told, bemoaned the fruitlessness of what was happening. And she said, Look, forget about the fishing. Enjoy the peace and quiet. Reflect and pray. God will guide your thoughts and ease your mind. And you can see now, that's the picture I just took on my phone from the wee spot where I was. And it was just gorgeous. When I forgot about the fishing, I still didn't get a bite. So the, the end of John 1 to 20 didn't really work for me that day. But... It was just gorgeous, and God just did bring into focus what uh, he wanted me to share with you. And if you have your Bibles with you, if you turn to Joshua 21, and verse, we're going to read verse 43 to 45 as the starting point of where we're going to look at. Joshua 21, 43 to 45. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their forefathers. And they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their forefathers. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord handed all their enemies over to them. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Every one of them was fulfilled. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to come into your house, meet around your table, open your word, and pray. And as we begin to look at this passage and what leads up to it, 
We just pray that we will come with hearts that are receptive to what your Spirit wants to say. We pray that the familiarity of your Word will not prevent us from hearing your voice. We pray, Lord, that if you want to to teach us something, that we will be willing to learn. If there's something that we need to change, that we will be willing to unlearn the things that are in our lives. And if there's something that you need to remind us of, help us to be willing to relearn things that we have heard in the past. And we pray, I pray, Lord, that there won't be a single thing, a single word of mine that will be remembered, but only your words and only your name will be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. These are amazing words. And it's an incre- they reflect an incredible moment in Israel's history and in the journey of the children of Israel. And if you look at them up there, the words, they are just incredible words. But maybe we actually struggle today to read those words with any conviction. Maybe we can't relate to them or to the language of them or to the experiences recounted in them because they're just words of victory and a success and achievement that actually we don't think we have experienced in our lives. The book of Joshua has the recurring theme and challenge to believers that actually our best days are ahead of us. They're not behind us. And what I want to talk about today is that this is a message of victory and confidence, a confidence building message, a message of entering into God's promises and claiming them. It's a message we need to hear and to take hold of as we meet together as church. Philippians 1 verse 6 tells us, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on until the day of Christ Jesus. Carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Victory is assured because as 1 John 1 verse 4 says, you dear children have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Look at the the words in this. Take possession, settle, rest on every side. How we would love to experience that victory in our lives. So today we're going to go on that journey. And we're going to see, and I'm going to challenge you to see if we can place ourselves somewhere on the journey that the children of Israel traveled. And I'm going to ask you, to see if you can find where you are on that journey and to see if you can be honest and place yourself in that. It seems to me there are three very different stages and there may well be people in this church today who are at each of those three different stages. Now, the first stage takes place in Egypt. The children of Israel were slaves to Pharaoh, bound to life, That was not what God had planned for them. Chained to a master who didn't love them. But God provided a means of salvation, a way to escape that bondage, a route out of slavery to freedom. The Passover lamb who was sacrificed. But faith is a choice. And the children of Israel had to put the blood on the doorposts and lintels to allow the angel of death to pass over them. And if that choice of faith was made, salvation came to the household and deliverance and freedom followed. For many of us, possibly for all of us, we can recognize our story in those images. We were slaves to sin, bound to a life that that wasn't what God had planned for us, chained to a master who didn't love us, but God provided a means of salvation. We've just been hearing about it, we've been praying about it, we've been singing about it. A way to escape the bondage, a route out of slavery to sin, the Passover lamb, Jesus, who was sacrificed on the cross. And for us too, faith is a choice. We've had to choose not to put the blood on our doorposts and lintels, but to recognize that the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Ephesians 1 verse 7 tells us, in him we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of Christ. 1 John 1 verse 7, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sins. And remember last Sunday, Pat talked about the fact, the invitation, Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That invitation is there for anybody who doesn't know Jesus today. And as Bill gave it today, if anybody is here who doesn't know Jesus. And as we came around the table today to remember, it's possible that you're here and thinking, I'm still in Egypt. I've never accepted the offer of salvation. That offer is here for you to accept, to be forgiven, to be free. But sometimes, you know, we, we actually make excuses for ourselves. We pretend and we, that we struggle to make choices. We don't. We really don't struggle to make choices. We make them all the time about things that don't matter. As soon as you put those up, you will probably instantly know which of those you would like the best. Or maybe you don't like any of them. But you instantly know by looking at those which of those you would prefer to go to or none of them. Put this up. Yeah? Even by the reaction. Some of you will definitely be Man United. Some of you will be Liverpool. Some of you couldn't care less. But you have, you have an opinion on that instantly. You can make a choice about it really, really quickly. Yeah, you've got an opinion. You can make a choice. And so it begins to get serious. Now, let's get really serious. If I put those two flags up and asked you to pick two teams, we would be very quick and very capable. Our hearts would tell us. We would be able to make. And isn't it amazing that we can make choices about things which really, ultimately, don't really matter? And yet, we're, going to, we're prepared to delay a choice which is going to matter for eternity. I hope there's no one here today who's not prepared to make the choice to be free from Egypt. The children of Israel accepted the offer of salvation and marched into freedom. And if by the Holy Spirit you're being challenged to make that choice, recognize that the enemy, Satan, will try to stop you. He wants to keep you bound and in chains. Wouldn't it be great if you left church today singing the song, my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has rescued me. That offer of salvation is open to you. The children of Israel accepted it and walked into the next stage of their journey. Now, I'm not going to go into amazing detail about the next bit. In fact, I'm going to fast forward through the jubilation of escape from Egypt through the Red Sea, past a bit of moaning and complaining, past the provision of manna and water, out into the vast unknown. But this is where I, I am going to say a wee bit which may get a bit uncomfortable because I think we have a tendency to skip over the theology and the application of this second stage which takes place in the wilderness. And you can see the massive area that it is from Egypt and all that, in that V-shaped area there, which is all this wilderness wandering that they did. But Israel wasn't rescued from bondage in Egypt to live in the wilderness. Israel was rescued from bondage to live in freedom, to possess the promised land, to live in victory. When God spoke to Moses through the burning bush in Exodus 3, verse 78, this is his declaration. It was rescue from Egypt and delivery into a promised land. There was no plan for a sabbatical in the wilderness. Now, fair enough, there was a journey, but there was no plan for a sabbatical. And there is no plan for a sabbatical for us, for you or for me in the wilderness. So what happened? Although they were free from Pharaoh, they were still enslaved to fear. Exodus 15, 24, we're going to die of thirst. Exodus 16, 2 to 3, we're going to die of hunger. Petty fist. And so it continued and prevented them from stepping into victory. 
Numbers 13, verse 33. We're going to get squished. When the spies went to see the, the land, 10 were bad and two were good. 10 saw the problems and instilled fear. The Israelites, as a result of that, spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness, getting no closer to the victory that God had promised them. They were consumed with the fear of the giants in their lives. But you know, we are all the 12 spies. So many of us live consumed and governed by the giants in our lives. Giants of our past, of our fear, of our sense of inadequacy, of hurt or anger or bitterness, of our present, of unfulfilled dreams, of unanswered prayer, of negativity, of anxiety, of our tendency to criticize and find fault, of attitudes, of neg prejudices, of insecurity, of its future. We could go on and on and on. The obsession and fear of these giants keep us walking aimlessly through the wilderness and away from victory. I wonder if we were to do a wee bit of action research here or to take it wider and do it right across the Elam movement, or go wider still and do it right across the evangelical church in Northern Ireland, and ask the question, I reckon probably high, quite a high percentage would be able to tell us and re remember the day they escaped Egypt. I, if I were to ask you, you'd be able to tell me the, the day or the time you were saved. You'd be able to record that. But what percentage would be able to record and say the last time they defeated temptation or experienced answered prayer? Or what percentage would say they were living in victory? I read a survey recently about one, sorry, yes, I read a survey that was conducted in America and only 11% of evangelicals described their lives as victorious. Now, if a school had only an 11% pass rate, for pupils. You wouldn't be too keen to send your pupils there. If a hospital had only 11% recovery rate for patients, you wouldn't be too keen attending it. If a football team only won 11% of its matches, they probably would appoint Solskjaer as their manager, but that's, that's another thing. But you get the point. If we as a church, if only 11% are living in victory, we should be asking ourselves, where, go, where are we going wrong? Is there truth in this? Have we lived in the wilderness for too long? Have we gone round the hamster wheel of spiritual existence far too long? And are we still living there today? The enemy, Satan, wants to keep us in the wilderness, away from the promises of God. But the Holy Spirit wants to help us get out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And the good news of the story is that for the children of Israel, there was a way out of the wilderness for them. And there's a way out of it for you and for us. And it seems to me that as I look at what happened with Joshua and the children of Israel, it can be summed up with three letters. Probably lots of other ways, just as I looked at it, there were three letters. Remember, no worship. RKW. Now, I collect stones. Well, Kim and I both collect stones. Hers tend to be in a ring and her diamonds. But I, I, collect, I collect stones. <laughs> and our house is full of them. And I want to sh show, so show you some of them. Um, and when I look at them, they remind me of people and places and occasions. So this is a wee stone that Kim and I got uh, when we were away in China, uh, walking the Great Wall. Gareth was there too, and, and Doug was there. So whenever I look at this wee stone, uh, there's a reminder of that journey, and a, a reminder, I suppose, particularly of, of Doug and things like that. Um, this is a, a stone I picked up on one of my many walks in the mountains with Andy, and, and so it sits, um, and it's always a, a great reminder to me of, of that. This is uh, this next wee one. These are four wee stones which are, which are stuck on top of each other, and I call this the analog stack. 
And uh, this is one that I picked up when, when Philip and Ethel, Kim and I were out for a walk on the beach and just stuck it together and made it into a wee pile and it sits and it's just a nice wee reminder of a lovely day on the uh, beach. And these are, these are two wee flat stones and we, we, we call these the Kearney coasters because we got these when we were down with Ken and Roberta at Kearney and we use them for our tea and coffee and they're just lovely because they remind of a lovely day. Of a lovely day. And, and then one of the other ones, and it's hiding over here, and it's the big one. And this, this big stone, this, there's a whole lot of these at our house, but these guard the gate posts of our house. They hold the gate open. And these came from, from, these, these came from uh, my parents' house and from my grandparents' house uh, before that. And so they remind me when I see them of my parents and they remind us, Kim and I, of the fact that every morning, my parents would have prayed for us and remembered us, everything that was happening in our lives. And so why am I telling you about that? There's a great, there's a great theology to stones. You might think that these are just rubbles that are laying about our house, and sometimes you look at them. Just, but there is a great theology to stones. And I want to tell you about that. To leave the wilderness behind and to move to victory, Joshua reminded the children of Israel of what God had done. He reminded them of the miraculous crossing of the River Jordan. And we did touch on it in one of the songs, how God had stopped the water upstream flowing and piled it in a heap to allow them to cross on dry ground. And then in that crossing, he commanded the priests to lift 12 stones from the middle of the water and to bring it across and to put those 12 stones up as, an old, as, as, a, as a heap. As a memorial to the people who put the clicker somewhere. As a memorial and as a sign. As a reminder that God had been faithful and that God keeps his promises. Joshua 4, 21 to 23, a reminder of what God had done. In the future, when your descendants ask their, fa their father, what did these stones mean? Tell them that Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground, for the Lord your God dried up the ground before you, you until you crossed it. And a reminder of what he had done. He did, or why he did it. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord. If you're going to get out of the wilderness, and if we're going to get out of the wilderness, we need to do the same. We need to remember what God has done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And we need to remember why he did it. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Joshua knew that before he could get out of the, uh, the, the children of Israel could get out into victory, they had to be reminded. And we're the same today. The start of the journey was to remember what God has done. And the start is, if we're going to defeat our giants, is to remember. And they, and they didn't go to Jericho before they remembered. And the, remi the reminder also helped the children of Israel to know, know who they were. They were descendants of Abraham, heirs to the promise a chosen people, and they needed to know whose they were, children of the one and only mighty God. And for us too, we need to remind ourselves of God's love demonstrated in Christ, even as we celebrate each week around this table. We know who we are and whose we are. We're no longer a slave to fear. We are children of God. And this table speaks to us. And in the same way that the story doesn't end in the wilderness for the children of Israel, so it doesn't have to end here for us. They were ready for that third stage because they remembered that victory had been won. And what a third stage it was. Seven nations conquered, 31 kings defeated, approximately 10,000 square miles claimed, seven unbridled years of success. Wouldn't we love that? Wouldn't that be fantastic? The children of Israel made the choice to become promised land people. They'd believed and had been saved. They'd lacked faith and wandered for years. 
Now they made the choice. They remembered and they knew. But before Joshua made, went to Jericho, there was another important step. He remembered, he knew, but he had another encounter. In Joshua 5, and this changed everything. Joshua 5, verse 15, on his way to Jericho, he met the commander of the Lord's army. And the commander of the Lord's army told him to take off his sandals for the place he was standing was holy ground. Joshua did so, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. When Joshua looked at Jericho, humanly speaking, it was an impossible giant. But when he fell down and worshipped, God made a way for victory. Jericho was strong, but Jesus is stronger. Joshua learned that the way to victory was worship. Now the test, Joshua at Jericho. This was going to be a test like no other. A fortified, impenetrable city that seemed to sit between them and the promised land. Joshua led them not for a conventional battle, not a single sword was raised, but victory was overwhelmingly complete. When we look at our giants, our problems can often seem insurmountable. Indeed, humanly speaking, they probably are. But when we remember, when we know, and when we fall down and worship, God will make a way for victory. I don't know what your giants are. In some ways, it would be exciting if all our giants could be defeated with a single slingshot like David did. Wouldn't that be brilliant? I think sometimes I think it would just be class to be able to take and just go out like David. But you know, the reality is that's the only time that happens like that. Mostly, I think there's a lot of hard yards in our battle. A lot of walking round and round walls, wondering if anything is going to happen. A lot of shoe leather that's used, like they did at Jericho. But the walls came down. Our nation is facing a battle in coming days, and it's not a conventional battle. Fiona was talking about it earlier. It's a battle for the lives of the unborn. It appears as if we're facing impossible odds an impenetrable citadel, determined to defeat the very heart of God. But God will not be defeated. And we as an army of ordinary people still have opportunity to march around those walls and pray them down. Today, October the 13th, is an opportunity to pray specifically for the protection of the unborn of our, in our society. And right across our country, people will be doing that. To pray for, for women and for families to pray for our governments, both in London and Stormont. We can also take action to sign online petitions against those proposals, and we can challenge political parties to restore the executive for the 20, October 21. Let's make sure the shoe leather is worn. Remember, no worship. Joshua 21 reminds us beautifully, God keeps his promises. All he had sworn to give their forefathers, verse 43. All he had sworn to their fathers, verse 44. Not a word failed he had spoken, verse 45. The promise for us is a promised land life in which we are more than conquerors, Romans 8, 37. We have the Father who loved us, the, Savior, the Son, our Savior, who died for us, the Spirit, our, our counselor, power and strength to equip us. We are more than conquerors. The land of Canaan is not, a, is not futuristic. It's not heaven, because it's not perfect. Still things went wrong in Canaan. It's a land defined by grace, refined by challenge, and aligned with a heavenly call. In God's plan, in God's land, we will win more often than we will lose. Forgive as quickly as we are offended, and give as abundantly as we receive. We serve out of our giftedness and delight in our assignments. We may stumble, but we do not collapse. We may struggle, but we defy despair. We boast only in Christ, trust only in God, lead wholly on his power. We enjoy abundant fruit and increasing faith. Canaan symbolizes the victory we can have today. 
because the victory is won and the battle belongs to the Lord. Faith is a choice. Choice to be saved and free from sin. Choice to be victorious. We have a glorious inheritance. And Joshua let the people depart. And he has, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing to enjoy. So as we finish and as the, the, the worship team come and we'll finish in a moment in, in, with a song, where, where are you living? Are you in Egypt? Are you in the wilderness? Are you in the promised land? How are you living? Are you in slavery? Are you in frustration and weariness? Are you in victory? If you're still living in Egypt, the offer of salvation is open to you. Faith is a choice. If you're wandering in the wilderness, remember who you are and whose you are. Faith is a choice. If you're in the promised land, march round those walls until they fall. Be confident of God's word. How to face those walls? Remember, no worship. Let's just pray and then we'll, we'll finish our service. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this, this passage in Joshua, which gives us confidence that victory is assured because the battle belongs to the Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have won the battle because of what Christ has done on the cross. Help us to remember what you have done, the finished work of Christ, the precious shed blood that covers all our sin. I pray that there will be no one in this service this morning who leaves without making peace with God. Father, I pray that if we are in the wilderness, if we have wandered aimlessly, that we will realize we can leave the wilderness. We can, we can cross the Jordan. We can remember what you have done. We can know who we are and who we are. And we can worship you and step into victory. Thank you for this church and for this opportunity to worship you. We just pray as we, we, we finish in worship that we will know that every giant can fall when we worship Jesus in Christ's name. Amen. Oh,